Welcome to another episode of Celebrate 98 brought to you by Tennessee Cider Company with Fred White. I'm Dave Hooker. He hails from South Carolina. He was a consistent force on Tennessee's defensive line, and I'm going to overlook the fact that he's a Lakers fan because he's a fantastic interview. Jeff Coleman, ladies and gentlemen, joins us now, and uh, Jeff, great stuff, man. We look forward to talking to you. I remember interviewing you for the first time a few years ago, and I was like, man, I wish I would have interviewed him more. He's a really good talker, so uh, thanks for being a part of it. My wife, she says I like to talk a lot. I don't know if that's always a good thing, but she says I'm a I'm a I'm a talker. I won't say she won't say good, but I'm a talker. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Fred, tell us about this guy, man. A good consistent force on the defensive line, and uh, just uh, a loquacious, a guy who seems uh, really affable. Tell me about uh, Jeff Coleman. You know what, man? That's that's big, bro. He came in the class before me. You know, 94, I came in 95. That's that's big, bro. I always been big, bro, since I met him. I, I got a quick story to tell. This is this is going to get us started here. Before you tell that story, I, I do have one request. Yes. What's that? When you talk about the class of 94, you have to always say the number one recruiting <laughs> class of 1994. Like we, yeah. we have a, a designation. <laughs> we were number one class. Just like ask it. I like well, it. For the rest of my number class, man, class thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the number one class. <laughs> when I came, when I got to campus, you know, I didn't know anybody. I'm from Griffin, Georgia, man. I'm fresh out. <laughs> I'm fresh out of Griffin, Georgia. I didn't know anything or anybody. I didn't know who to trust, who to talk to. One day, I'm in the room, just sitting there chilling. I wouldn't even come out of the room. I would go work out. I go right back to the room. Wouldn't do anything else. Jeff knocked on the door one day. And this is how he broke the ice. Hey, man, you got to get out of that room. You got to come out and hang out. He said, we got to sit here and play some spades. You want to play spades? I was like, yeah. I'm sitting there thinking, man, I didn't know y'all knew how to play spades. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that was just a Griffin, Georgia thing. <laughs> man, I, man. I, I haven't been anywhere, man. You know what I mean? But like, but that kind of changed our whole, and ever since then, he always, it's been the same ever since that day. Griffin, we we talked about this before. On Griffin is like Gaffney is just is, is Griffin, South Carolina. That's all it is. It's the same place. We we came up same type of environment, yeah. and you know I I remember being Deuce sitting. I remember sitting in that room, not knowing anybody, trying to adapt, trying to get comfortable, and having to you know try to feel my way way around, try to get comfortable with everybody. And it's like, man, no, he, he left some of the story out. He's actually sitting in the room with all the lights out. Like, it's dark in there. And you're not like, what are you doing? I walked in like, what are you doing? I, we, we were before a minute there. It was like, come on, man, you got to, by getting out, I, I wanted to get him to some light. It was like, he get some vitamin D, man, get some sun. He was, uh, yeah, he was in there on the phone, homesick, you know, that sort of thing. Like, man, yeah. you got to get out of here. So let's let's get out and about. So, yeah, yeah. I. Jeff, you you had your class that came in, and then Fred's followed it up. You had a I have a pretty good idea that you guys were on the verge of something special with two back to back classes, right? right yeah. Back to back. I mean, what what are you thinking at that point? How how good could you guys be? What's going through your mind? Well, I, I actually bef even before that, um, I can't. I, I was watching from like ever since, and I tell you know the story. But one the thing that got me locked in. To, to Knoxville, to Tennessee was um, when I was watching that kickoff classic because I was a Colorado Buffalo fan just because of the, they had two defenders, Canavis McGee and uh, Alfred Williams. And I, I liked them. And it was because they, they were similar to my high school. So I was watching Colorado. And then when we played, when Tennessee played Colorado to that 31-31 tie, that's when I, and I saw Cobweb. And then that's where I started to get locked in with Tennessee, that was the day I became. Well, after that day, was I put me on put me on my path to becoming a volunteer. So I started watching, and um, you know, I came up in '93. We still had the turf. We played Georgia. I watched Heath. I watched everybody that we had before then. So I, I saw it coming, and that's what attracted me. You know, part of what made me come there, because you know, feeling like it was home. But I, I knew we were on the verge, and we were working on something well before our. I think everybody in our class kind of saw that. Um, I met Peyton at we were at Florida State on a recruiting trip that year. You know, saw a couple of other people 
that, you know, ended up being in the class. And, um, yeah, you start staying. That's where you – and that's where I kind of relate to what we're doing right now. We've been doing it for a while. You, you start stacking those classes, you know, right on top of each other. That's when you start to build. You, you, you know, you're going to get some stars. You're going to get some impact players. You're going to get that depth uh, where we didn't have right now the last couple of years. We had some really good players. But if somebody got hurt, somebody got tired, you just don't have that depth to play in the SEC. So that and that's really what we started to do. When you stack five, six, seven classes together, and I and I tell that and I, I talked about our ninety four that ninety you know ninety four class being number one. But you put ninety five and you look at ninety six and then ninety seven, that was just the the cherry on top. That ninety seven class, all of, all of those classes I just mentioned were incredible. But yeah, even I, I'll give it up to ninety seven. They from top to bottom probably the best one of the bunch, but yeah. Fred, to have that sort of leadership or mentorship, uh, how important was it for your class and, and you in particular to have that from Jeff? You know, it, it was amazing, man, because it's they taught us how to play the game. I always say this. And I know sometimes some guys agree, some guys don't. We don't win the championship without 95, 96, 97, 94 class. Well, none of that. But like that group before us, the guys that were seniors in 95, hey man, they would they command the respect and you respected them. And when it was your time, you got the same respect they got, right? If you're one of those people who did your job. And you just knew, okay, they set out the they basically set the the play the the play in motion for us, right? And literally, we kind of just took it and ran with it from there. But all the tools we gained, we gained from that 95 squad. That 95 squad taught us everything. They taught us how to win. Well, you've, you've said that a lot, and the coaches said that too. And it was, Jeff, I guess a dedication to hard work and accountability. Is that the best yeah. way to put it? Yeah. That was yes. – right up until the 98 season through 97, 96 and on. I'll, I'll take it back a step further because, you know, I was there my, my red shirt year in 94. I think we finished eight and four that year. And that was, it started off a tough year. You know, we were, we, we I think we played four quarterbacks, I, the two freshmen, uh, and we were still, you know, trying to find our way and figure it out. But you, it was obvious that there was a foundation there and the talent was there to make it happen. And it actually started in 94. Once they righted the ship, they set us on course to be, cause you know, we come back in 95, 95, we just, you know, you gotta think we lost we were 11 and one 95. That started the year before. And, and I say the, 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 the red shirts, the handful of us, you know, Mercedes Hamilton, Jarvis Rito, Steve Johnson, the, all of us that were there for that to see, you know, to, to pick up what we picked up and to see what we saw, then, you know, I think that's what was was valuable once we got to 97, 98, especially just going through that, seeing that process and knowing how far we had come and just understanding what we had and knowing that we had to really just seize the moment because we had gone through 95, 96, 97. I, you know, we, we, we could have won more, but like we didn't. And this is like we have our opportunity and we knew what we had in front of us to be able to draw upon that experience. And then just to 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 close the deal on that thing. I, I know from talking to Fred, some of the leaders in his class, obviously, uh, you know, Al Wilson was was a guy that was an incredible leader. Who were some of the leaders in in your class that got things really going in the right direction after the eight and four season, which Jerry Colquitt got hurt, I believe, on the first drive against UCLA? Oh, you, you have like there were some incredible some guys that went out there and played right away. Like I said, there are a handful of us that redshirted, but you have Terry Fair. You have Jonathan Brown, you have Marcus Nash, you have, you know, Peyton, Jarvis Rito, Ron Green. And I was just wondering, if you watch, you know, Ron Green when he finally got to play, he he didn't, like, I think he registered also, but what he did before he got hurt really set the tone and put, I won't say it put people on notice, but it's like, this is what we have, you know, looking forward to. But as far as those leaders, you know, you really and you look at the people who went out there and at an at a early age and a, at a, you know early in their careers really, you know, did some things. You know, like I mentioned, Terry, J- JB, Jonathan, Peyton, Brandon in his time that he was there, uh, Jarvis. A lot of guys went out there and, you know, 
just really established themselves early. Yeah, Fred, Steve yeah. Johnson, a, a broadcasting major, College of Communications. So yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll throw that out there. We had class together. Yeah. Um, he, uh, I think he did a little bit better than me in class, though. It took me, I was on the six year plan, but nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, great guy, great guy. Yeah, Love Steve. Great guy. You know, for that 95 class had some, it was senior, a lot of seniors on that class. And it was the offensive line was kind of the lead. Um, you got guys like Bubba Miller, Trey T, yeah. Leslie Radliff, what's the other uh, Jason Layman, Just Jeff Smith. That whole all those guys were just yeah. real solid dudes, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just solid dudes. And that they, they kind of led, they like. Hey man, they they were kind of if you weren't gonna practice hard, they were gonna let you know about it. But and, and that's the thing that I tell then that's where dude, you and I talked about like that that link to where there's some people that just walk on campus and they're just they're natural born. Like Al Al is Al was a lead from the time his true freshman, like the minute he stepped on the field, he was a leader. You don't get those, but every so often, like and maybe yeah. in a generation you only get one of those. Mm -hmm. Everybody else has to come in, pay their dues. You prove yourself on the field. You learn how to, from the older guys, how to conduct yourself, how to lead by both examples. Some people are more by example. Some people are, you know, they talk and lead, which is, you know, you have to have different kind of leaders. But yeah. those guys really showed you the way, showed me the way, showed us the way on how to be leaders. And especially, yeah. you know, of course, everybody razzes the young guys a little bit. But at the end of the day, they, they were teaching us after we get past the, the little bit of razzing. They're showing you how to how to conduct yourself, how to be a I, I say the word professional, but we're collegiate athletes, but how to conduct it's a, it was a job for us. We always looked at this like a job, yeah. how to conduct yourself as as in, in that manner. And you learn that from the older guys. You know, when you step out of line, the best coaches can't really do that part of it. The best policing and the best discipline on the team comes from inside that locker room. And we had yeah, exactly. great, great locker room. I, I tell this story to I told it before. Uh, one of the first practices we came in two days, we're coming off the baseball field and we're walking back to the uh, complex. And I don't forget we had the orange Gatorade cans. And I tell, I was man, I was tired. I was beat. I was just, and I just, I, I finished the can and I just, I threw it on the on that road in between. The, I just threw it down. I was, I was littering. And <laughs> Jason Layman comes up behind me. He was like freshman. Pick, you know, pick that. I was like, oh, I was, I was like, okay, I'll get it, I'll get it now, I'll get it this time. But um, just, but that that was one of those things. It's not a you you look at it, it's not important. It was a can. Somebody was gonna get it, but it's the this it's, it's so much that goes yeah. into that. Exactly. You're, yeah, you're tired. Just because you're tired doesn't mean you're not supposed to do the th the right things. And that's like, okay, you gotta make better decisions, think better. Something small like that, it obviously stuck with me for a long time because I still to this day remember it. Um. That's mm -hmm. just a, a, one of a whole bunch of examples of just those, you know, being a, a leader and the older guys teaching, taking the younger guys under their wing. You remember being a freshman and they, the rule used to be <laughs> on the bus, in the locker room, or even yeah. at the cafeteria. Hey, man, uh, you don't have enough hours to say anything yet. <laughs> you don't right. even you have, ain't got you don't have enough hours yet. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this, hey, you don't have enough hours to have an opinion yet. You don't. Okay. Because what you don't you don't know enough to to say enough to weigh in exactly, and that that was nobody liked it at first, but it's like yeah, when you got in a position to be that other guy, like you understood it and you got it there exactly, so, and that, but that was teaching us how to be leaders too though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and Fred, I want you to because you and I've talked about it, um, kind of address the 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 transfer of leadership of power so to speak um and but i'm i'm curious in, in particular you, there was a lot made of uh, Peyton Manning setting up off season workouts and that sort of thing i don't know how much he did how much the whole team did it but um what kind of an impact did he have even though he wasn't a part of the 98 team leading up to that what kind of an impact do you think Peyton Manning had before his nfl career man a, a huge cuz you got to think about something we're practicing we are practicing every day against the number one quarterback, the guy who went one in the draft, considered one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play the game. Like, that's the guy who we practice against every day. I mean, every day. Now, there are some days where he, he got to us, but 
we got to him a lot. I guarantee you he didn't see as many in college. He didn't see no defense like ours, except for maybe Florida. Yeah. Right, Jeff. I mean, so I, I give I, and I agree with that take, but I, I'll give you a different take. The impact that he had on ninety the ninety eighteen. We were trying to get from under his shadow, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but yeah. Peyton True. Manning has such a large presence, and he held that presence for four years. And I'm not saying, you know, there weren't other players and people that got attention, credit, whatever the case may be, but it was all it was about him. And, again, I don't mean that in a negative way. And this gets me to, you know, <laughs> the story about, about Coach Former. When we, had, we have a senior meeting, Every year. And I know I'm saying I'm going to give it a different take. I've told this story before. I'm going to give it a, a different take on it. Um, because we had just lost some of the other guys I just mentioned. We just lost Terry Fair. We just lost Marcus Leonard. And, of course, yeah. Peyton. And, JV. yeah, JV. And, you know, we have, our, we, we have that meeting. And Coach Former, and I it, and I keep I keep asking him about it. He said he, he was joking. He was doing it to motivate. But I, he meant it. He, he told the, the seniors, he's like, I'm looking around. I don't see all the people I just mentioned. And I don't know if we're going to be seven and four, six and five next year. He said wow. eight and four, six and five. Eight and four, seven and no, five. No, no, no. You weren't in there. He said six and five or seven and four. It was he not eight. Up, he I said it another meeting too, though. I would have taken, okay, but I would have taken that eight and four. But he, <laughs> he didn't give us enough credit. And for, for the longest time, like I said, I, I was – and that was because Peyton wasn't in there anymore and those other guys wasn't there. And for the longest time, I um I took offense to that. I, it bothered me. Then when I sat and I, I think about it, like you lost all these guys. You, you open up the season against Syracuse and Donovan McNabb. We play Florida, haven't beat Florida in a while. Go to Georgia, go to Auburn, play a tough Mississippi State, play a tough Arkansas. Like, oh, shit. So – I could kind of see that, but our, it was motivation for us. And I say that it it was motivation to get from under those guys. We, we had a bunch of guys who had been waiting their turn, a bunch of guys who were trying to prove themselves, redeem themselves. Um, it was just a bunch of we we a lot of people had chips on their shoulders for various reasons. Oh yeah, we did. And yeah, we a lot of see. people had that. So that's some of what they loved. You you and it's not like you you played under the behind these guys. You can play behind John. You play behind Lenny. You get your opportunity. Okay, what are you going to do? So there was a lot of that going on in 98. Yeah, it was prove yourself. Because because here's the thing. When, when your coach says you're going to be 8-4, and four, we're 8-4 we're and four team at best. Hey, man, that locker room, I don't know if anybody else in that room felt like I did. I think everybody did. I'm like, hey, man, it, it's, did he just say that? He really see, did just say that. And see, you you talk, we're talking about you talking about the full team meeting. I'm talking about the smaller seniors when he, he meets yeah. with the seniors. Do you, you know that meeting? He yeah. said that in front of everybody again, too. That that's when he he added a win to it after that he when he was talking to everybody. Room, <laughs> he said it to the full room before too. And uh, I've I've had every five years or so I asked him about that, and he still says he didn't mean it. He meant it. He was he was serious about that. We had our own team meeting after that. We kicked all the coaches out of that, that meeting room. Wow. Yeah. I remember that. I remember just like some of the things that were said. It ain't my story to tell on that part. So I let somebody else tell it. But that part was, I think, when we left that meeting room and went to practice that day, I think we knew at that moment we were going to win that championship. That it was that. That moment, that day, that meeting? I think it, it put everything in motion because it made you feel like, dang, they don't even believe in us. But we believed in us. And it made See, you work harder. I, I'll be completely honest. Um, I knew we weren't going to be six and five, seven and four, eight and four, six, seven and four, eight and five or whatever. I, I didn't at the time. I, I knew we were going to be. We just had too much talent to not be good. Because exactly. you, have, you have to think, um, a lot of what drove that '98 team was a lot of the young guys. A lot of a lot. We we had a really good mix of grizzled, old, about to get out of here, been here too long veterans, the upperclassmen right behind us, and then these crazy talented young guys. But crazy talent doesn't always equal product on the field. We've all seen mm -hmm. it. So. 
I knew we had a bunch of talent. We had a bunch of young talent, but you don't know until you actually see it. So once we got a couple games into the season and I saw these young guys, I was like, okay, then whatever concerns I had, they, they were gone. It was like, okay, we can run now. I, I knew we were going to be good. I didn't – I'm not going to lie. say I didn't know we were going to win at all early in the season. But once I saw these young guys step up, I was like, oh, yeah, we got something now. So You know, Jeff, I feel like we're going to win the next championship every year we were there. 95, I thought we were going to win the next championship. I thought that before. I thought we were going to win the next championship. 97, I thought we were going to win the next championship. 98 and 99. It wasn't a year that I didn't think we were going to win. Well, let me say, I want, I want to win it every year, but I'm also – and I'm speaking as 47, thinking back of, like, being realistic, like, yeah, I I want to win it every year. I thought we were going to win it a bunch of times, but – I think too. Yeah. <laughs> we had the talent. Yeah. We had a talent too. I guarantee you that. Uh, so, so Fred told me this uh, story, and I think I think you recall it as well, Jeff, about kind of the 1997 SEC championship game in which you guys were trailing, and there was a uh, kind of a a change of the guard, so to speak, in the locker room. Um, so, <laughs> I, I, I want to get to that where a guy named Al uh, something, maybe Al Wilson, yeah. Where he um, kind of set forth his his leadership skills. We're going to take thirty seconds. This is Celebrate ninety eight, brought to you by Tennessee Cider Company. Tennessee Cider Company is the first cidery to set up shop in Gatlinburg, surrounded by the mountains that hold and defend a spirit far better than moonshine. Thirty seconds and back. Celebrate ninety eight with VFL defensive lineman Jeff Coleman and safety Fred White. These mountains hold and defend a spirit far better than moonshine. A drink that holds flavor that becomes necessity. A hard cider made and relished by folk who are as hearty as they are legend. A refreshment that can only be found in one place. With a taste that makes you say, give me three bottles of the good stuff. Tennessee Cider Company, where necessity can be found. All right, Fred, so set the stage, halftime at the 1997 SEC championship game, and you guys were expected by everybody to win easily. You had Peyton Manning, who should have won the Heisman Trophy, um, but didn't play your best first half. And then what happened at halftime? No, let me say this real quick first. Tennessee Cider Company, if you go into Gatlinburg or Pigeon Forge area, make sure you stop by and go and see them. It's a great experience to go to their water and get a, a tasting and those type of things there. It's a fun time, too, by the way. Um, so we're not playing great on offense this first half. Tequil Spikes. Tequil Spikes has something to do with that, but I'll let you, their defense, I'll let you tell this. Their stuff. defense was pretty good. Their defense was in the top ten Absolutely. over the year. Absolutely. They were good. They, their secondary was good. They had a really good football team. D-line was strong. Um our offense is not playing very well. But on defense, we're playing lights out. Yep. We're playing lights out. We're, keep, we're keeping us in the game. And I remember when we get to – we had, what, six turnovers in the game. Six. I can't remember how many there were in the first half. But getting to the locker room, and I just remember <laughs> – I remember the leader, the sheriff, he got ready to stand up and say something, and he started. And I'll just leave it at that point and let Jeff take over from here. Well, no, because I, I this is where I'm going to go with this because there's there are two things. Peyton is, was outstanding with like showing you the way. Yeah, he was he was never a great like speak inspirational speaker, and, and that's yeah. not take it again away from him. He really did give us some good talks, but it, that wasn't that wasn't what what made him elite. Yeah. And also the other part of that, if you know Al, anybody that knows Al, like that was normal stuff. The only reason we're still talking about this is because it was Peyton. Al, that's no, Al. No, 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 no. Because no, it, honestly, it at that time, you know, he re he never really said much. It was only a few times he actually said something. Oh, oh you mean reason, for everybody else? But I mean yeah, that's the reason what why I'm talking about. Is here, here's what I'm talking about. It's the reason Al why. Al in practice, Al, all the other times, 
was because like that's what he did that day wasn't like out of character or like crazy no. to me. So so what what did happen at halftime? I've heard the story, but a lot of our listeners and viewers haven't. I don't think we can. Re- I, I don't think we could ever um, <laughs> recreate the speech. I don't even think he could. But no. uh, I just think I know he got the point across. And I just the one thing I remember him saying was, "I've never won a championship at any level." Yeah, Here that was the important. That was and, the important thing. Yeah, yeah. He was. I, I never won a championship at any level. And Which I had to talk to him about that. Hold on, hold on. I had to talk to him about that. I said, as good as you are, you didn't lead your team to any championship <laughs> before now. What are you doing? So, yeah. He was like, he had never won a championship on any level. He was no. like, man, and we had a championship game, and y'all BSing, man. Y'all BSing okay. here. And it, it was that, that's that's the clean version. That's the only version I have that I can say. Yeah, it but was, but the fun, I like the fun thing about that is that it's grown to he threw a trash can, he threw a chair, he knocked down the wall, he tackled <laughs> Peyton, he did like it's it's, 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 it's taken its own legs and grown, you know, a, a, a whole new legend to it as the years go by. It it did what it was supposed to do. It was one of those yeah. things to where in the moment. It wasn't. It wasn't like it was a movie or anything. It was like, oh, okay, let, let's go. It's like, yeah, let's do it. Because what he said, and I think it was an important thing. Of we're not playing up to our potential. We're, not, we're basically giving it away. We have a championship right there in our grasp, and just go take it. And that was okay. that was the gist of that. And again, that was one of those building blocks on the way. I think that momentum carried on, you know, further, and it just propelled on to the to the even the next year. It was important. I, I do remember this part of the story too. At the end, when he said, <laughs> "If I don't see it in your eyes, you walk out this locker room, <laughs> y'all ask me to go back in." <laughs> so, was it more the the old guard leaders, or was it more the new guard leaders taking o- over for the old guard leaders, or was this more of the defense saying, "Hey guys, let's get things straightened up," or a little bit of both? I, I don't know what to do to take on that, but I don't see it either way. I see it as just that's Al being Al, and I'll take I'll let I know Deuce is gonna get back to that part, but that was, and again, it's it's memorable because it was the SEC championship game. It was one of those moments, but Al would do that on a Tuesday in the middle of the week against UAB yeah. when you don't want to pro- you don't feel like being at practice. It's six games in. It's yeah. not a big game this week. You you slacking off at practice. There were many a days I felt like me and him going out back somewhere because he'll get in your face and he's like, "You you can't. This is this isn't good enough today. You need yeah. to do. You need to pick it up. You need to like, like ah, come on, man. It's like again, it's Tuesday. We're playing. I don't want to disrespect any team, but we're playing somebody that's like you know not like that. It's like no, he wouldn't it, let it, you. It's not disrespect if it's true. He, he wouldn't let you. No, I'm not gonna do that though. He's not gonna let you slip into that and that's why we were that's another reason why we were so good because he didn't let mediocrity set in he wouldn't let you get content and that was just it was yeah the the halftime speech is great to talk about but that was a consistent everyday thing with that man and it was like he irritated the hell out of you at some the times with it but it's one of those things where you somebody you know somebody's telling you something you know is good for you you don't want to hear it at the time but you appreciate it and you, you you never forget it you, you remember this this saying? All right, we're gonna go out there and have perfect practice today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, no mistakes. Yeah. Hey man, and if you're the person who made the mistake, hey bro, everybody looking at you like, really, dog? Like, <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I, I I gotta ask because you you guys are both tough guys, and Jeff said he almost went out back without one time. I mean, was there ever a point or where he, he maybe crossed the edge where somebody? Was going to tussle, or did he just know how to toe that line, so to speak? No, it's it's one of those things. It's just like you you fight your brothers, oh, and, and it's literally. I know that sounds cliche to say, but there are some days I love them all, but you don't like everybody every day, and you know <laughs> that it's the best thing for that moment. You guys, we get into pushing. We more so fought the offense. We weren't fighting too much amongst the defense, yeah. but yeah, you get into a tussle, you have. Like little conference, little tension and confrontation. That's in that type of sport with the way we play that game, 
with everything, with the stakes being what they are, when we're playing, you're going to have moments like that. But the true test of that is how do you, what happens after you do that? Mm. Do you carry grudges or like we hugging and we going out, hanging out, like we're at each other's apartment or dorm room right after that. Nobody gets mad. You know, we understand what it's for and what it's about. Yeah. You're going to have that. And, and, and you know, we didn't, we didn't have a whole lot of fist fights. No. Not a few, but <laughs> there are a few that were kind of funny too, but we had a few. Um, yeah. But if someone actually told you you were doing something wrong or told you you weren't giving enough effort, hey, man, they meant that. And Especially a peer. Team, and it's, it's different coming from a coach than it's coming from a peer. Right. When your peers tell you yeah. you're slacking off, because coaches, this coach talk, like they get on you even if you're doing right most of the time just to pull more out of you. But when your peers and your teammates tell you, hey, man, you don't have it today. They say you need to do better. Like, that's something that's that's just, that's different yeah. than coach it's stuff. It's a respect level for one. I mean, like, hey, man, you respect the fact that they're telling you, hey, man, all right, look. They, know, they don't mean you can't play. They don't mean you can't ball. That means, hey, bro. It means he knows I can do better and he <laughs> want better out of me. And that's like the same. Yeah. Other people. You're better than what you're showing right now. And exactly. Pick it up, gotta, bro. Let's go. Yeah. I want to turn, if that's all right with you, Fred, to the season for a second, because Jeff, you you got off to a fantastic start, especially that, that Florida game. How primed and ready were you for the '98 season? Because you played well against Syracuse too. Mm -hmm. It was for me because I had a, I came off of a, a really I had a really really good camp. Um, if you think about it, I, I missed that spring because I had sir had a, a injury. Had a, that's when I was moving from defensive end to defensive tackle. So I just felt like coming into fall camp, again, I had a lot to prove and I had a short time to prove it. And you look, again, that's one of those things, you look around the room, you see Billy Ratley, you see Ron Green, you see Darwin Walker, you see all of this. If you don't bring it, then you're going to be standing over there oh, watching sorry. You can feel the sidelines watching. And that's <laughs> like our, that's our brotherhood, that friendly competition. So I did I got I had a really good camp and it carried um it just carried over into the season. Got off to a really good start, you know. And then you know, you hit the middle of the season and people start to that's one of those things to where I don't know if they they didn't see me because again, whatever film they had on me was a defensive end. And then what then you start I started playing defensive tackle and then you start having some success. And I'll never forget, we were playing Houston. And I think we had come out, I'd had a, the, those games. We played them after Florida, I think. I, I had the Syracuse game on tape. I had Florida in tape, on tape. And then this the guard, well, this guard from Houston, he was just real geeked up. Like, 90, he kept calling me 92, 92. You're not going to do me like you did. So, and so I'm like, what's, what's wrong with this guy? But it was like, he was real. Then it's like, oh, now you have people now, to, now gunning for you now because you've shown, you know, you've had a little bit of success. And you got to match that type of energy. You have people, like, gunning at you now. So, you know, that was a little bit different. Had to adjust to that, too. So, mm -hmm. Fred, when, yeah. we, we, they had – you guys had superstar players all over the field. But you also had consistent players. And Jeff was kind of the epitome of that. Um, how, how important was that, just the consistency that you got through everybody throughout the yeah. year? Man, our motto on our team, well, our motto for that year was do your job first, then you help. So regardless of whether you're a superstar or a guy who's, a, you know, not a superstar, whatever it may be, when you on the football field, do your do your job. I was about to say another word, but <laughs> keep it clean here. <laughs> do your job. You know what I mean? The whole thing is help later. You can't, you can't, how, you, how can you help somebody if you can't, if you're not doing your job? So that was our <laughs> motto. Do your job right. first, and then you help. So whatever that means, whatever that, you know, that situation comes, you just know, do that first. Take care of your business. Handle your job. Win your battle. If it's a one-on-one -on -one battle, win it. If it's a double team, win the double team battle. Whatever it may be, you win your battle. That's it. That means do your job. So everybody was accountable, being held accountable for just to do that. You know what I mean? Because when you don't do your – at least – because, yeah, you have a situation where – you can make a great play, you can make a play, or you just do, like Dude said, do your job. Because if you get out of position and you don't be where you're supposed to be, 
then somebody tries to make up for you, and then there's yep. a chain reaction to that. Everybody's trying to make up, you start scrambling, and then that's how when you see plays pop, when you see a lot of big plays and things of that nature, it's because it started with one person not doing their job, and then everybody else trying to scramble to make yeah, up for it. Yep. Yeah, and that's that's the thing for us. It's just like Coach Brooks would always tell us, you're not out there being a blocking dummy. You make a play, make a play, but m- make sure you're not the one who's who's the the weak link, weak link in that play. And, you know, getting out of position and, and, you know, giving up opportunities like that. Yeah, it's just like, you know, you know do your job first, make plays after that. You know, do it like, for instance, if a defensive end or defensive lineman or defensive tackle is in the wrong gap or mm-hmm. get washed or whatever, man, that causes a whole different chain of reaction. Now, yeah. your linebackers got to make sure they do their job. They can't get blocked. Yeah. And then your safety got to do its job. But also, it, it puts stress on everything have, else. Yeah, yeah linebackers can make make a bad decision on something that calls for a touchdown to happen. Secondary as well. But you just so, you got to do your job. And don't. I, I can remember. Was I think it was ninety seven. So Sean Alexander's we were playing Alabama. Yep, yeah, I remember um, the play. I that play. Exactly so if you, we was we were stunned. We slanted. Everybody got across the yeah, face man. of the offensive lineman. One person. One person out of eleven didn't There's do. No more. Quit calling somebody's day. Like, I'm sorry. Stop that, we know. We, stop we, that, we, man. We, we I talk about this every time I see him. So, every time I see him, I talk to him about that. One it's person, okay, it's, Jeff, it's okay yeah. since you all still won. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, and Sean Alexander hit his head on the goalpost just yeah. because of a, miss, a misstep. And it was one like everybody – if, if you look at the film, it looks so – it's like synchronized swimmers. Everybody was like, mm. and one step. And it he's gone, and that's gone. how easily something like that can happen. Yeah, that one, and it was so fast. The second we couldn't even, we couldn't over, like overcompensate or, or like no, he was gone. It it so was fast. He was gone. He was out of there. He was, he out, was he ain't out the gate. One step. That yeah. was it. That was it. I still, man. I talked to him. At, listen, he when he sees this. And when he comes on, I'm gonna bring it up. Then we, too. we we know the I play like every time that, I see him. That play, yeah. Every time, because yeah. he. No running back had ran for over 100 yards against us until that game. Right. And he got he got 102. So if he didn't get the long run, he don't get 100 yards on us. Yeah, I think it was like 47 yard touchdown or something like that, something around it. So yeah, he, he was. You know he, my you know my my situation with Sean Alexander. You know how we. Don't... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want him to get 100 yards. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you you gave me some great insight when you and I first talked about the 98 team a few years ago, and it was that Arkansas game and Mm -hmm. how that played out, what led up to Billy Ratliff making that play? Because you, you were kind of somewhat involved there, right? Yeah. yeah, It's funny. Well, you know, because, and I don't even talk about how the, like the starting situation of whoever goes out there first or whatever, but you know, I was, was starting that year and that it started that week in practice. I don't know. I, that was the week we had the creatine in the drink and nobody knew it was in the drink. And I, I started cramping up. I started having issues with cramps like midweek, like Wednesday, Thursday, and it just continued into the game. Um, that was a, it, that first half was tough. Anybody, if you watch the game, you remember that game. That first half was tough. And we were, we were going up against a really good offensive line and offensive line men, um, you know, that particular day. And I was just – and it started to really kick in for me again in, like, second quarter, third quarter. So that series, I that what led up to that series is, like, I could have been – for me, selfish because like wanting to stay out there, wanting to play, wanting to do whatever. But and that's the trust that we have in each other. I know I don't have to go out here and tax myself or at the expense of our team because I know there's other people that's waiting to play that's that's going to do the job as well. That's going to do the same job, do the job better, whatever the case may be. So when I started to to have issues again, I had to, they had to pull me out. I was actually I had to get I had to get an IV that game. Uh, at wow. least I had to come out. At least I came out the game maybe three, two, three times, but yeah. I had to go get an IV. And I like that series. I told Worm, I was like, "You gonna have to go." I was like, "I don't have it right now. I'm, I'm cramping. I can't move." I'm like, "You're gonna have to go." And I, I think if if I were in the game at that time, that certainly wasn't gonna happen because I didn't have that to give. Like if you look at because one thing that really just irks me to this day is people talk like he just tripped and 
drop the ball. That's mm-hmm. not what happened. Like with the people that know know, but there's some just casual folks that's like they don't understand what Billy did to make that happen. Mm-hmm. And I know at that particular point in the game and what I've gone through, what I've been going through that week, I didn't have that to get. So, you know, fortunate that I can hear him, not so not a selfish person and just Billy being a, the, the the talent that he is went out there and made a play. And that was just that that's just indicative of what our team was in a lot of different ways. Nobody cared about who did what, got what glory, got whatever. It was about us winning and us winning together. Like we all celebrated and that I was just as happy for him as whoever he was and everybody else. And that's just that's just what our team was. That's what made when us you're special. On your, when you're on the field, do your job. Yeah. Plain and simple. Man, man, and, do I, your job. And, I, and I and I didn't feel like I could do my job up to the standard at the time. And I I like I knew he could. But that but that 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 goes to say like basically we had depth, yes, but we also had a rule like you could put anybody in and kind of not miss a beat. We had a lot of good yeah, on the squad. And, and you should you never know. be out there like winded, tired playing because you knew somebody else could play. Yeah. Everybody's looking at you kind of funny if you out there, you obviously tired or something wrong with you, and you still trying to play. It's like, man, come on, get out. You got somebody yeah. else that can play. Now, we used to tell coach sometime at halftime, hey, coach, <laughs> hey, man, these two guys are balling. We need them in the game at the same time. It's third, fourth, fourth. Of course. But, <laughs> but that's, but that's the player knowing. You, that's right. You understand the matchup. If so, Again, if somebody does, we play the same position and they got it going on and – they they got they out there they got it cooking, and it's it's, it's scheduled for me to come in right now. I was like, no nah, man, you like you, just run your hot hand until it's not running no more. Yeah. I don't need like the reps to fight. Like just keep going, and then we'll yeah. we'll work that out. So for, I mean, for those that don't know, maybe a little a little bit younger in our audience, Billy Ratliff basically blew up um, the offensive line. Brandon Burlesworth in particular, who he said had dominated the whole game. Lance Starner did. tries to use the football is a crutch for some reason and he kind of lays it on the ground but one of the most memorable plays in uh tennessee football history um fred you and i you know i've talked about that play and the confidence that you guys had afterwards but it was really the confidence you had beforehand that you knew that you were going to get the ball back somehow it seemed like to every man you were going to get the ball back to t martin who eventually handed it off to Travis Henry, I believe it was what, six straight times. I, I think I think there's a – I don't know how everyone looks at playing the game or any game for that matter, but I look at it like this. If it's time still left on the clock, I still got a chance. Whoa. So if it ain't 0-0 zero, zero yet, I got a shot. So that's my that's always been my thought process. So, I hate seeing people like – Mail it in after you know if it's you down fourteen and it's two minutes now. Hey man, you, a, a few things can happen. A fumble can happen. An interception can happen. A sack in the end zone can happen. We never know. You go out here and you play till the game is over. But dudes, look at this. If you and it, I think our confidence in that moment came from earlier in that game because again, if you look at that first half and you look up what led up to that, they that was a tough game, man, and we weren't. Yeah. I, I'm not even gonna say we weren't playing well. They were just playing better. Listen, and this is they like were, three points, three yeah. in the second half. Twenty-one yeah. points in the first half, though. That's right. So we, but there was never a point in that first half where I stood over there and felt like, oh, man, we're gonna lose today. I never at one point felt like we're gonna lose mm-hmm. today. It was just a matter of when we're going, when are we gonna figure it out, mm-hmm. and when we're gonna turn it on. Like not, I don't, we, you can't flip a switch and something like that. But we're gonna figure it out at some point. To Deuce's point, like we we got way too much time on this clock to figure it out, and even if Sterner didn't fumble, right, we we still had what two timeouts? It was like three minutes left. We had that offense. We were we were going to figure something out at some point, like that. But that whole day was like that. But like, I never at one point felt like we were going to lose. Not at any point that day yeah. that I felt like we were going to lose. You, you kind of referred to the Al Wilson speech. Uh, it is funny how when we remember things, they get even more sensational. I was thinking when I went back and looked at that play recently, they were almost uh, like at the 15 or something. But, no, it was, it was around midfield. 
Yeah. And there was more time than I thought. It was thought. like three minutes. Yeah, two. We had two timeouts, three minutes. What was it? Second? Was it second down? I think it was that was second down. I think it was, it was second third and six. Down. Yeah, I think it was yeah. second six. It was second yeah. and six. So we we get a stop there, get in a total. It's like we, you know, yeah, of course. We we like the, the longer the story goes, it's like they're at the one. Uh it's 10 seconds left. <laughs> yeah. it like, you know how it goes. Eventually, Billy's just gonna put on a cape and fly out of Neyland Stadium. That'll be the story. He's gonna, he's gonna pick the ball up. He ran it back. <laughs> he could have if he had got his hands on the ball. He was out of there. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, Fred, any, anything else uh, you want to add uh, as far as visiting with Jeff again? Our Celebrate '98 series is brought to you by Tennessee Cider Company. Uh, we'll close it out here, but um, I got one question to ask you for sure. Though. Okay. Tease it for me because we want a message from Tennessee Cider Company. We wouldn't be here without them. How about that? Te- oh, give me a tease, a radio I, I, tease. I, I, you can do it. I, I, you want me to ask the question now? Uh, yeah. Go give ahead. me the subject. Give them the subject line and not the real question. Yeah. We've been talking about all these games we won and those type of things. What's the one game you wouldn't want to play again? Okay. That. That is a tease. Look at my man with the broadcasting background. It's all brought to you by Tennessee Cider Company. A hard cider that's easy to enjoy. One that's crafted to perfection. You need Tennessee Cider Company. Some say it's the signature cider of the South. Others say it's the cure to your craving. They all say you'll savor every sip. With a selection of ciders free to sample, all it takes is one taste. Visit TNCiderCompany.com for more information, as well as to shop our ciders and merchandise online. Thirsty yet? Doors open at 10 a.m. There you go, Fred Askett. So the one game you wouldn't want to play again? In 1998? Yeah. The one game I wouldn't want to play again from that year, and it, this is going to sound crazy, and I'll tell you why. UAB, University <laughs> of Alabama, Birmingham. In... Did, did you and I, did we do the interview about Georgia Tech? Was that one of the interviews before the season started or was something else? Because I, I think it was for the, same, for the same reason. You did. You sure did, yeah. UAB had these extra wide splits. And as a defensive lineman, you're, you're used to being in a certain place. And our defense is designed to do a certain thing with you being a certain amount of distance from me. Like, it, we just – it just threw everything off. and you 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 want you see this big gap right there. They had these huge gaps, and you just want to just r- take off, run through it, and that's what they that's why they do it because they want you to run up so they can run behind you. And it yeah. was like this constant. They had they had me thinking too much. They had I, I didn't I don't think I got cussed out that much <laughs> from the whole rest of the year as I did from that game. I, I remember the Monday Tuesday after practice, Coach Former walked up to me. He was like. It was a tough one, wasn't it? I was like, you know, still made some plays, still didn't play, but but it was just I was I was I wasn't sure of myself. The game wasn't thinking. I just it just felt awkward. Didn't feel right. I didn't. If I if there was one game from that year, I didn't want to play. I wouldn't want to play again. It was that one. University yeah. of Alabama, Birmingham, and those ridiculously wow. wide splits. <laughs> you guys won thirty-seven yeah. to thirteen. I got to watch, it, watch the film now. Go back and watch that film, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Now that I've mentioned these splits to you and how it looks and how I was play, like playing unsure of myself, you'll you'll see what I'm talking they about. They ran that wing T, but it, uh, so so me and Dion got benched that game because <laughs> we were arguing back and forth on the field because we couldn't figure out like I we knew we I knew what I saw. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But like. But they were messing with their tendencies, and that's what I'm talking about. They yeah. the, and people run the wing T, especially at high school and college level, because they don't have as much talent, and it's to confuse you. That's to make up for the lack of talent, and that, exactly. and they 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 had me confused. That they had me unsure of myself that day, and just we, it we went against our tendencies and what you practice. We had just had a third down stop, yeah. and after that third down stop, me and Dion were late coming out the field, so it was too many men on the field. So our defense, our Coach Ramsey pulled us, <laughs> sat yeah. us on the bench. <laughs> yeah, we, we eventually got back in the game, but that's embarrassing. That's really embarrassing because <laughs> we wow. could have argued on the sideline. We were arguing yeah. like, <laughs> right there on the field. Because I, I told you that Monday, Tuesday, Coach was like, he also said he was like, I don't know, you have another game like that. He said, look, you see who's 
you see who else is standing on the sideline over here waiting. It's like you can't you can't do that again. So I was like, yeah, yeah I got it, coach. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a rough one. I, I gotta ask this question too. Just because it's it's 1998, it's reunion. 25 right. years. 25 yeah. years, long time, man. 25. Take me through your impression of or what you think about that that game, going the experience, what it was like to be there, to get there, to be there, and the game itself, and just kind of stuff that things you remember. The you national know? championship game itself? Um, or like the events, locker room, whatever, man, you know, anything that happened that you remember, and it kind of is vivid. No, I, I, want, I want to talk about the game because – and I, I'm, I want to be completely and bluntly honest about just part of the game itself. I'm not going to say it's never a letdown. When you win a national championship, it's not a letdown. But I, our, and I can say our national championship was Florida. That I didn't, you know, it was kind of like, we, I remember when the clock ticked down to zero. And obviously, I was looking at somebody, it was like, that's it. It was like, you, it, was, it, was, it, it was so much. When you tell somebody, when somebody tells you it's about the journey and not the destination, all the, all the fun, all the emotions and everything for that year was in the journey getting there. The destination and finishing it, it almost seemed like a chore. It's just like, all right, we got to get over this. You get that far, you don't want to mess it up. It's like it was a little bit stressful in that regard. It's just like, but it was all the fun that season and all the emotion was in getting there. And the game itself, and for, and for me, I have to put a little caveat on that because for me it was a little bit different because, I, you know, I got hurt in the SEC championship game. I wasn't even supposed to play that particular game. And I was just dealing with that, you know, dealing with some person, just being out there, not not being 100%, not being completely. You know, when I went back and watched the game later, I was like, hey, he played pretty damn good to be 60 70%. Right. But I still had that in my head. So it was um I was happy. We were all happy, but not as happy as when we be Florida. And it was just like you climb that mountain and it's like, dang, is that it? Do you appreciate it more now though? Oh I do. I, I, mean, I appreciated it then. It was mm-hmm. like I appreciated that whole season and, and being in that moment, I, I do wish I had been a little more open like in that moment instead of you know some other thing. I wish I had been in that moment. A little bit. The, the further you get removed from that, the more you appreciate it, and the more you you know how hard it is, and you know what it is. And it was just, you know, I was dealing with a lot that game just for me, and it was, um, you know, I wish I had, uh, appreciated that moment a little bit more. I took it in a little bit. More. Well, goodness gracious! Don't be too hard on yourself, Jeff. You're probably in pain. Um, and okay. yeah, I bet you're in a lot of pain. You went out there and played at sixty to seventy percent. You said, how important was it though? to be out there in the national title game because nowadays guys will skip bowl games and that sort of thing. But you, you well, want to be there for the capper, didn't you? Well, for me, it, there was a lot that went into that decision. So when I, when I got hurt in the SEC game, um, we had, you know, I, I had to make a decision and it was decision for me. It was like, okay, shut you down. You have surgery. And that, that was, that was never really an option for me. My next question was, Okay, if I rehab, if I do all these things, can I get back out there? Yeah, but you're a senior, and that's going to push your – because the, the conversation – and this is where, you know, you had a lot of people giving you different advice because working with the people – you had people telling me, well, you want to have this surgery as early as possible so you can try to get ready for either the combines, workouts, or anything else. So I, I'm sitting there with the decision of I, I, I was guaranteed one more game. That was a national championship game. Or I could have taken an attempt at another career, which I still was able to, but the injury, you know, that's that pushed my schedule back. But I just chose, like, I put so much into this, this, this team, this season, all my boys, everything else. I there's no way if I have a chance to get out there and play that I'm not gonna do it. There was a I never really paused for a second. Like once they told me you have a chance. I was full speed ahead with that. I, I lived in the in the training room. The trainers were at my apartment, like just rehabbing constantly, just to try to get back out there. I don't, I don't regret it. I do it. I do it again. If I had that same same situation in front of me, I would do the exact same thing because, again, I put so much into that. Because the worst thing that could have happened for me is that I didn't play that game, 
have the surgery, but then I get out and I go get cut by somebody and never play a game of football again. That would have been the worst thing, and I wouldn't have gotten over that. So I knew I had that game in front of me, wanted to play it. I did. Don't regret it. And then, you know, I tried, you know, playing after that, but the injuries, the, if the same injury caught up with me, I had to shut it down. But that was, like I said, I don't regret that at all. And for the for those that don't know, what was the injury? Oh, I, it was, well, in court, that was – my, one of my teammates hit me. I tore my meniscus, my MCL. I had a frac. I fractured my. I had a hairline fracture in my um, tibula, the right below my kneecap, and that was like the worst part of it because I couldn't really put any pressure on it. And then I didn't have because I'd had two other surgeries in high school on that same knee. So at that point, I didn't have any more cartilage in my knee. I was like bone on bone. So I was I was dealing with like four different things in that one particular injury. So it was a little bit of injury now, and then some of the older injuries caught up with it. So, yeah. And you played on that. I did. I did. Play, play with that. And when I <laughs> – I remember because I didn't practice in the bowl prep at in Knoxville. I didn't practice. First, I practiced the first time when we got to Arizona. Um, and like I said, I didn't I didn't feel good. At, like, if you – I'm obviously – if you watch the film, I'm obviously hurt. Because I'm, I couldn't really bend my leg that much. Couldn't really push off of it. But uh, as we talked about when we're off camera, nobody I, like I didn't see any point where anybody got the best of me. Made made some plays, still moving the line of scrimmage. So I I I, I was. It took me a while to even watch the game, just for obvious reasons. But when I watched it, I was like, okay, it made me feel better. It was like I didn't hurt my team. I played, but I, I played well. I did what I was supposed to do. Did my job while I was out there. I you know contributed to to the win. And that's that's yeah. what it was about. So, at the end of a season, a lot of guys are banged up a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just know, hey, man, I I know what your best is. Give me whatever your best is right now, because it's right. going to be better than a lot. It's going to be better than a lot of people. Yeah. So I'd much rather have that than not have you on the field at all. So and you know, it's funny you say that because you you know how much I love Coach Brooks, and that is to this day is still one of my closest people he always checks on me and my family like we he 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 he's the one who even when I was playing defensive end and while he didn't feel like I was getting enough reps there I wasn't even practicing a D tackle he would put me in a game at defensive tackle I, there were games where I played like all four just because he put me out there and in that game and speaking of getting up the two when you do when you said just give you the best I got he knew I couldn't play 40 snaps play 45 snaps or whatever so he would play me in short burst and the first two times he did, you know, I'm going out with two, three snaps at a time. And I like, I came off the field and I was just, I was frustrated with the, being injured, frustrated with not playing. And I, and I said something to him that I, <laughs> we laugh about it now. It wasn't nice. And he said it back, like we had a little exchange, but he was trying to protect me. And just, he knew that I, like, I can only have you in so many, like a couple bursts like that, but it was just frustrating. But he knew he was protecting me from foreign getting hurt, you know, worse than what I was but also just saving, like, giving it so I can give my all when I'm out there on the field. Yeah. So, yeah. It was good to have a rotation like that, having, you know, having yeah. that rotation like that. It, it was, was good. It was, it was yeah. incredible. Oh, man. I love it. it. Even, even when it before, yeah. was like, that was it, was, it was the best. You could, because you knew whenever you're out, you could just give your all when you're out there. You don't have to worry about trying to pace yourself. Yeah. You, just, you could just go. This, this right here means I'm, come out. I can't go. And if you yeah. do this and don't nobody come for you, that means, hey, man, you got one more thing. <laughs> nobody, you patting on the head and nobody looking at you is the worst thing. Like, come on, man. <laughs> I mean, come one on. more play, I said, buddy. One more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, obviously, tough, courageous, uh, except for you being a Lakers fan. You seem like a real stand up guy, Jeff. <laughs> I'll just leave it hey. that. I, I appreciate that. I'll take that because you know everybody's not supposed to like the Lakers. We know. Yeah. You're so darn good. Yeah, we know. <laughs> you've had like, uh, except for Jordan, I think you've had all the greatest players of all time. Everybody, that's right, that's right. No, I, and I, I want to stop before we. I don't want to get out of here before I thank you guys for having me on here and just the the way you go about getting in. You know the questions you ask, the way. That you go about it. It's 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 a conversation. It's not. I don't feel like I'm you taking off questions on the interview. I, you guys do a great job. I appreciate you having me on. It's uh just like talking with old friends always. Always. Fred, Fred's the man. I'm I'm window dressing. 
So but that's, I, that's I, big brother. And, and and when I come to Charlotte, where am I staying, Joe? Right. Oh, uh, it depends. No, it depends on what he's trying to do. <laughs> he'll either stay with me or Leonard. It depends on what his agenda is. So I'll put it that way. <laughs> it, de- it depends on what his agenda is. Hi, uh, Jeff. Thank you, buddy. Uh, I have, have, have a fantastic uh, off season and all of the celebrations that will come up. You guys deserve every single bit of it and more. Uh, it was a really special time to be a Knoxvillian, to be around Tennessee's program. Um, so fantastic stuff, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. And it's not going to be long before we get another one. It's coming. I feel I, I, I truly believe that we're going to get another one. But, yes. It's coming. It's there definitely coming. He is Fred White. I'm Dave Hooker. This has been a presentation of Off the Hook Sports. Thank you, Tennessee Cider Company. Celebrate 98.